You like my new glasses, Mike? They look great. You Are have yours? completed the nerd look now. It's totally true. It's totally true. For those who can't see me at the moment, go check my Instagram. There's a picture of me with them on. Uh, my wife picked these up for me for Christmas. So I have now jumped into the world of computer glasses and have a set of Felix Grays. So no more blue light in the eyes. That's the theory, right? That's how, that's how this works. <laughs> nice. I've never heard of that company before. So they are specifically blue light glasses. Mm-hmm. All right. It's what they do. Yep. I ha- our, our friend of the show, Josh, is uh, a big fan of them. I have seen his and enjoyed, you know, I threw him on just very briefly, I believe. I vaguely recall doing that. Josh can correct me if I'm wrong <laughs> on that. But uh, I'm a fan, you know, I've worn him for a few days now. And uh, I can't say I've had any like groundbreaking changes as a result of wearing them, but I know that my eyes don't seem to be straining as much which makes me wonder if that was part of some of my headache migraine issues that I've had in the past. Just Mm. curious now. Yeah, could be. But yours are blue light, right? I don't believe so. These are Warby Parkers, and I paid for the reflective coatings, but I did not pay for the blue light filtering. Got it. I do not think. That's right. I was thinking you did something with that, but maybe... Maybe do you use like the was it flux or something along those lines for Oh yeah, love flux for the computer. Yep. Although I've been doing a pretty good job of not using my computer at night, so I don't see it active all that often. <laughs> I don't. I regularly use my computer before the girls go to bed. Thus the glasses. <laughs> Got to love it. Those who are asking in the chat, no, these are not. I'm, I'm quite certain it's impossible that the same frames. They look very similar, yep. though. They do. I would say that. Cool, cool. Uh, follow up. I don't have any to report on, which means I'm. It, it's up to you, sir. What do you got? <laughs> I didn't take a stand for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Happy New Year. Not That's taking not, a stand. <laughs> not entirely true, probably. But I have basically been off the grid since publishing the last episode i scrambled to get that one out the door on christmas day and then basically didn't do anything until (laughs) we record this on new year's day yep so haven't had a ton of opportunity to do that sort of thing i've been thinking about this and i this isn't exactly the spirit of the action item but one of the things i've been thinking about is this whole concept of hustle because there's a lot of like anti-hustle messages in the productivity space right now, which I agree with the spirit of those. I know that the the term hustle is typically associated with somebody like Gary V. And that's not what I aspire to be, but also I wrote a book called Thou Shalt Hustle. (laughs) Sure, yeah. I'm in the process of updating that to a 2.0 and not just a 2.0 it's going to be significantly expanded i basically developed a whole bunch of thought processes and systems around uh, mental models and things like that since i put that out i want to make it something i'm i'm proud of and uh i'm working on that and i've been thinking about do i just give up on that title or do i double down on it <laughs> Sure. And I feel like if I were to give up on it, that would be in some way kind of the taking a stand against something, saying, I don't want to be associated with hustle anymore, but that's not how I define hustle anyways. So I could lose a bunch of people who see the word hustle in the title and say, well, that's not really appealing to me. But I think I've kind of made my peace with, I'm just going to own this, this term and stand for what I think it really means not the getting up at 5 a.m., staying up till 2 a.m. <laughs> hustle yep. that people right. associate with uh, some people on the internet. And I know I'm never going to win the overall war for redefining that term, but I think it's it's okay. And so this action item, even though it was not at all what I was talking about, that's kind of the outcome from it. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> if that makes any sense whatsoever, but my brain works in mysterious ways. 
Well, I know that like there's been a lot of folks talking about hustle online lately. I don't know why that is. I don't know what has caused that. But the thing that I've noticed is the people who are bemoaning hustle and saying you shouldn't do it are the ones who went through it and have come out successful on the other side. <laughs> That's true, yeah. So it's interesting to me that they'll tell you, this is not the way to do it. But they can only say that because they did it and had success as a result of it. So I, I struggle with that particular piece. I think I would agree that you don't want to be up till 2 a.m. working on something, up at 5 a.m. to start working on it again. Like That I wouldn't agree with, but I do hustle a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> when we were talking before we hit record, like I'm, or maybe it was after, I've been up you know, working on a computer till nine o'clock and then going to bed at nine fifteen, nine twenty. So like that messes with you a little bit when you're on a computer doing work at that time. So I'm aware of that. Uh, it's just a sacrifice I'm willing to make right now. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But. I think the thing is that like, if you listen to Gary V, the predominant message that he's saying, and I think Jocko kind of ventures into this territory too is like just shut up and do the work <laughs> and the problem with that is that if all you do is work uh you can burn yourself out and there's no guarantee that just doing the work will get you where you want to go anyways it's more important to be effective than it is to be efficient and the number of widgets cranked does not have a direct correlation to the quality of life improved <laughs> yeah so I get, you know, people's resistance to it. And I don't think you have to sell your soul in order to get any sort of level of comfort in designing a life that you want to live. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe when I update that book, we'll cover it on Bookworm and we can unpack my, <laughs> how I define it, stuff like that. But Sure. I don't know. I follow Gary Vee on a number of platforms and I, I, I hesitate to tell people to follow him yep. because he is so far over the top. But I've noticed that if you follow him and listen to what he says for an extended amount of time, you'll pick up a little little subtleties from There's him. There's nuance there, yep. Yeah, and it seems pretty common that people will say, like, well, how do I how do I get started on all this stuff? He's like, just do the work. Like, show up, do your thing. Yeah. And the more like one of the subtleties is you could burn the candle on both ends. He does in so many ways. And yet he will like the subtle pieces that you'll get out what you put in is the concept there. So if you want to get things up and running quickly, yeah, go for it. Yep. If you're willing to, you know, maybe build a more sustainable lifestyle that's going to take a little bit longer to get things up and going just because you're not pushing, pushing, pushing like what Gary V does. So I don't know. You know, I think it's... if you were to sit down and talk to Gary V, he would say the stuff that people think about the, the casual observer's opinion of Gary V, he would say, no, that's not right. That's not really what I mean. Right. But also, I mean, he's kind of wired that way. He is. <laughs> you should go listen yep. to the 10% happier podcast episode that I he's did. on. Yep. <laughs> that is hilarious. hilarious. It's uh, basically them trying to, it's Dan and a meditation expert trying to get him to shut up long enough to lead him in like a three minute meditation. Right. He just won't go along with it. Not like he says he's going to, but he's just a hundred miles an hour. And at the end he's like, yeah, that was powerful. It didn't do anything for me, but I can see how this could be. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true because they take, if, if you listen to it, there's like 12, 15 minutes of them trying to start the meditation. Yep. Yeah. And he's <laughs> just hilarious. like, like trying to like, so what do I, you know, and how do I, and whenever that's, and then, you know, oh yeah. And this reminds me of this. And then he's, he's yep. just nonstop. Oh, Gary V. How yeah. How get on this? Uh, my action item. Oh yeah. Hustle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've also, one other thought related to this. I've been thinking about the whole faith-based productivity thing and I've got some stuff percolating that I want to start publishing shortly on like the whole idea of faith and kind of the contrasting idea of fear. And so faith-based productivity, 
anybody who follows me knows who I am and what I stand for and how my Christian faith is a big part of who I am and what I do. But as I am thinking about these two terms, I actually heard them defined by somebody and it's the same definition. They define fear as the belief that what you can't see is going to come to pass and faith as the, the uh, believing what you can't see is going to come to pass. Whereas faith is a positive and fear is a negative. And I like that a lot. And so I've just been thinking about that and like, what does that practically look like? How does that influence your day to day if you are acting in faith or acting in fear? And the real takeaway from this, I think, again, more to come in the, the blog posts and the newsletters. But if you are being limited by fear, you're not actually that far off. You just have to have a little bit of a perspective change. And the thing that was negatively motivating you to do nothing can positively motivate you to do something that you are passionate about, that you care about. Going back to like Seth Godin and the practice and, and all that stuff. So stay tuned. Will do. I think I'm on that newsletter already. Yeah, I haven't sent anything yet. I got to finish this newsletter ninja book, but I've gotten some pretty decent ideas about this. Sure. And I want to make sure that the newsletter itself is entertaining and adding value and not just something like a lot of people view a newsletter as like a button that you push when you launch something to get money. Right. I don't right. want it to be that. <laughs> it's so I true. Want it, I want it to be something, you know, I mentioned, I think last episode, one of my words for 2021 is community. I view this as like a big piece of the community building that I want to be doing. And I just want to make sure that I've wrapped my head around it and I'm doing it the right way. And I'm doing it in a way that like I'm committed to and is sustainable, kind of like what I've done with the sermon sketch notes. I don't want it to be something that like I try and then I can't quite figure it out. So I give up on it. I did that last time. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, it makes sense. It does. It does. Well, shall we, uh, shall we jump in here today? Let's do it. So today's book is Lead Yourself First, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude by Raymond Kethledge. Also, Michael Irwin is on this as well. And uh, I will say that this was, I think, exactly what I thought I was getting into in that I, I fully expected a, a, a handful of stories and an explanation of how solitude can help you understand how to be a good leader. And that is exactly what I got. <laughs> Plus a little bonus at the end, which I'm very grateful for. And we will talk about a little bit when we get there. Um, yeah, what were your first impressions on this, Mike? Uh, this is not exactly what I had anticipated, but I didn't pick the book either. The first experience yeah. with this was when I opened the Amazon package and held it in my hands. Uh, I like the approach. There's some really great stories in here. There is not much I thought on the idea of practicing solitude until the, the very end. He's got some practical stuff, but I don't know. I feel like along the way there was opportunity to intersperse some of that. But overall, it's a really cool book. And some of these stories, I had heard versions of these before, but never anything close to the level of detail that they gave for some of these famous people. And so that made this really, really entertaining and, and really fun to read. It inspires me that you know when I write a book, I want to include a bunch of really cool stories like this. I know that that's going to take a ton of research in order to deliver anything close to the quality of what they did in, in this book. But then again, this is the very best uh, that I can recall uh, storytelling that I have ever seen. So that's my and there's thoughts a lot in a of nutshell. it. Yep. Because there's, well, I, I think I would say this entire book is just stories. There's not pretty much yeah. much between it. So it's it's broken up into four parts. We don't have a three part book this time, Mike. We do not. So it's a four parter, plus a fifth. 
plus a fifth, like an, an <laughs> ending of sorts. And I really pre appreciated that ending solo chapter. It's only eight pages. Um, but I remember I, I listened to an interview at one point by John Acuff. He was talking about some of the direction that Dave Ramsey gave him when he was writing his first book. I don't even remember what the first book was. Start, maybe? And uh, Dave Ramsey told him that if you're going to write a motivational book, make sure you have practical how-tos that yep. come with it. That way people can take that motivation and actually do something. And I, I'm trying to remember what the phrase was. It was motivation without application is useless. It was something like that, a phrase that's similar to that. But it was encouraging John Acuff to put an application aspect to his book at the end of the book after he had motivated people to do something. And that way they're not just left out trying to figure out what to do. That's exactly what he does here, where there's a massive amount of motivation to it. But then there's eight pages at the end where there's some form of application. I wouldn't say it's very practical, but it's like a philosophical, here's the concepts that you need to try to uh, put in place. And we'll get to that uh, and what those actually are when we get towards the end of this. But the four parts are clarity, creativity, emotional balance, and moral courage. He doesn't actually name the parts. That's just the name of the first chapter within those parts. That was and, weird, I thought. Yeah, it was a little bit strange. It made sense. I think once you got into it, because the, what was it, two, two, between two and three chapters behind each of those, explaining like various aspects or specific stories about that specific concept. So I think structure wise, it made sense, but it was kind of weird to not name the parts. It's just part one, two, three, four. Yes. And uh, I don't know why they did that. I mean, there's these four different parts which they could have combined into some sort of formula, you know, solitude equals clarity, creativity, emotional balance, moral courage, but they didn't. And because they didn't, it's kind of weird that part one, for example, which is titled clarity, uh, goes into the chapter one on clarity. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I did actually find in the the first like introduction part, he mentions these four different pieces and how those were going to be essentially the names of the four parts. So my mind sure. file actually says like part one clarity, chapter one clarity, which sure. is kind of goofy. <laughs> yeah. The table of contents, you're correct, does not actually list right. those things. Right. But essentially that's what he's doing is he's breaking these down into the individual components but if you skip the introduction, you wouldn't even know that's the approach they're taking, which is right. kind right. of puzzling. Like, why would you not? I don't know. Like, that seems very counter to a lot of the productivity type books that we we read. Uh, I think me specifically, I, I like to think in terms of systems, but I think a lot of productivity authors, like, that's what they sell is these dots that we've heard about before packaged into a little bit different way of thinking about them that they right. brand as their own <laughs> system. Yes. And it feels like just from a marketing perspective, there's an opportunity that was missed here, but I really don't understand it from a reader's perspective either, because if you skip the introduction, this is just kind of confusing at the beginning. Yeah, I could see that. And I, I will say, like, as I was going through this, one of the things that I struggled with was connecting things. I kept forgetting that the core was about solitude. And some of that's because he's so good at telling stories. Like, okay, let's hear about Dwight Eisenhower. Awesome. Oh, right. Why are we going down this path again? Like, the, I struggled with that somewhat. He always ties it together at the end, but... It's hard yeah. to see because some of the stories are so elaborate and so long that you sometimes disconnect what what the purpose of it was. So if I've got a critique on that particular format, that would be it. But on that anyway. note, I mean, as I was taking notes here, I found myself looking for that common thread throughout 
because it's a mind node file and this is yep. the part on clarity so what does this section in chapter three on the stillness of intuition have to do with clarity and he's such a good storyteller it feels a lot of times like he loses the the plot you know because he's so enamored with some of the details that he's sharing sure and some of the times I'm, I'm going through this story and I'm like, well, that's cool detail, but I don't want to write that down. That's cool detail, but I don't want to write that down. And then I'm like, okay, so how long has it been since I wrote something down? Like, where are we? I need a map. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I feel like, again, that's easily provided if we have that system at the beginning. I hate the word system to being used here because I don't think it really is a system, but really just bringing us back, recentering us on this is the core message like that part is suspiciously absent and i feel like the book suffers a little bit because of that yeah i think that's fair that is fair um i want to talk let's dive into these points but before we can do that i feel like we have to talk about solitude itself mm -hmm. which he doesn't do exactly which i thought was, which I thought was interesting because the first four parts here are talking about the results of solitude. Now, granted, as he tells the stories, there are various types of solitude that are discussed. And then you get to see the results of that solitude. So you kind of pick up what solitude is as you go through it. But I feel like for the sake of this conversation, it's not going to make sense unless we talk about it point blank which I didn't put in the outline. And I realized that only just now because well, I, I would say you won't pick it up as you go because I didn't realize until chapter 10, when he's talking about Doug Conant, the former CEO of Campbell soups, how he would reflect every morning. And he had those different areas. Sounds a lot like the wheel of life. And then they mentioned every couple of months, he does the deeper dive. And I'm like, Oh, that's a personal retreat. <laughs> <laughs> Duh, solitude, yeah. personal retreat. I, right. And then at that point, I'm like, oh, I should go back to the beginning and reread this. <laughs> sure, sure. But chapter 10 is when I made that connection. And I sure. like to think that I'm a little bit smarter than the average bear. <laughs> like, <laughs> I feel there, it didn't need to be that long before that light bulb went on in my head, but they just didn't really they didn't really make it clear at the beginning what they were going to be doing you know basic marketing they tell you say what you're going to tell them tell them then tell them what you told them sort of a thing yep there's absolutely none of that <laughs> in here. right right which at the same time i have to say that i appreciate to a degree i don't know haven't really decided quite yet how this fits into the spectrum because i also appreciate books that assume a base knowledge because they don't spell everything out for me because sometimes that tell me what you're going to tell me tell me and then tell me what you told me that whole concept that drives me up a wall sometimes mm -hmm. like, i'm not a third grader i know they tell you to write at a third grade level or a second grade level but i hate it i i hate reading it whenever they do that like make me feel like i'm an intelligent person <laughs> You don't yep. have to speak but, to me like I'm a child. But do tell us why you're telling Correct. us what you're telling us. Like, yes. what's the point of these stories other than they're fun to listen to? Yep. So there's there needs to be a more legitimate chapter zero here, I think. Because, like, and tell me what your perception of solitude was. So this is, so for me, what I picked up going through this is there's a whole variety of versions of this. Some of those can be going for walks on your own, going on something like a personal retreat, which would be multiple days. Uh, meditation is brought up, you know, a simple 10, 15 minutes. Journaling. Uh, and, yep, journaling is in there. Like there's, there's a bunch of these, you're taking time by yourself in silence. That seems to be the overarching concept here is time by yourself in silence. And that time frame can vary from five minutes to months so it really depends on the level of clarity and the level of well i'm jumping into part one there but <laughs> it depends on the level of difficulty that you're trying to overcome will dictate the type of solitude and the length of solitude that you've got to have 
I feel like most of the stories that he shares, especially in the initial chapters in the sections where he's not highlighting a historical figure per se, those are basically telling what other people do in order to practice this undefined solitude. So they are different applications of the concept of solitude, but again, like we don't have an anchor of this is what you are going for. It's basically just, yeah, I was going through a rough patch and this is the thing that kept me sane. And they tell a whole bunch of different ways of doing that transcendental meditation, running marathons, yada, yada, yada. Everything that you have ever heard of, you'll hear somebody who has done that successfully. But the problem with that approach is that unless you've tinkered with this and experimented on yourself, you don't know which one of those could be the thing that will work for you. And there's no real step-by-step on how to apply any of them. Sure. Which is fine. I mean, that's probably not what they were going for, but I could see if you are coming to this book, not having read the 109 that we have before this, you're like, oh, that's an interesting concept. I never heard of that before, but I still don't know what I can do right now in order to move me in that direction. I just know what this other person did. And again, like maybe it's just a stylistic preference. I don't really like that though. (laughs) I felt like (laughs) I was kind of left hanging on some of this stuff. And so I think for a newbie coming to this, you're definitely going to feel left hanging. And I feel like that's a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a, how do I put this? It's the author's responsibility to answer the questions that will arise from the reader as they engage with their material. I feel like this is kind of like having a conversation and not caring what the other person is going to say, just moving on with what you want to say. That makes it sound harsh and paints them in a very negative light. And that's probably not fair, but it's kind of like that in my opinion. There's there's one point I want to contradict you with, or argue with you on, in that what we're talking about here is he's not giving us the foundation of what is solitude, right? Like you you have anchored us, but if you think about the stories and what the results of solitude are. Part of me wonders if the intention here is that you are inspired enough to try solitude as you're reading this Mm -hmm. in order to understand it more. Because this first step, this first part on clarity, there's a lot of stories in there where people took time to themselves in order to understand a situation more. Like That's a lot of what that part is about, is how do I get clarity on what's going on, whether it's an analytical decision or... I don't even know. So business decision, like there's so many things trying to make a decision. Like there's a lot of, uh, you know, clear thinking and such that you're trying to find by getting away and being on your own. If you apply that to the book itself, I wonder if, because I didn't, so I, I can't tell you the results of that. But if we had, I wonder what the, what the uh, outcome of that would have been. Would we have had that same feeling? Or would it be putting the book into practice as you read the book? I don't know. Just an interesting concept I've been mulling over. My question for you is, what is this book about? (laughs) It's fair. It's a fair question. (laughs) Because I would argue that this book is actually about leadership. It is not about solitude. It is about leadership. Solitude is the vehicle that gets you to the leadership, the effective leadership uh, that you. What's the first word? You need lead yourself first, right? Yep. So if that is the case, they should explain to us what we're shooting for with this solitude. Yeah, that's fair. But again, like you have a good point. It's more about leadership, which is valid. I think maybe that's a misfire maybe on my part of focusing on the solitude side of it 
when the bulk of the book is about leadership and you know it is the first word in the title and it's inspiring leadership through solitude so leadership is the forefront i guess if you follow those two but solitude's the method so i focus on the method <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> so that's an interesting point yeah i mean the four the four components here this is really the, the we've got clarity we've got creativity we've got emotional balance and we've got moral courage really those are defining what effective leadership looks like those aren't components of solitude but solitude is directly tied to the quality of those four different characteristics so that's the part where i think we need a little bit more to to go sure. off of but we've kind of beaten that to death at this point probably so it's i don't know maybe we should just get into uh the different sections here and maybe we'll maybe my concerns about the lack of defining solitude will be uh, alleviated as we talk through this <laughs> sure yeah well the first part is about clarity i kind of alluded to that already and i i would say this is a of the four parts, clarity, creativity, emotional balance, and moral courage, I feel like this is exactly the right one to start with, with those four. Primarily because whenever people think about going off on their own, it's to clear their head. Like, that's probably the number one reason people would do that, myself included. Like, I use my commute to and from my day job in silence to just create a clean transition between the different modes of action that I'm engaging in and it becomes a very clean way for me to again shift my mindset from one set to the other but I don't do that very well if I've got a podcast playing in the car or music or like I don't do well yeah when I have that I've been in tune with that enough to know that if I sit in silence for that 10 minutes, it makes a huge difference on both sides, morning and evening. So having that time to clear your head, taking that space, you know, in my case, that would be 10 minutes a couple times a day uh, that I know I can count on, but I know that there are other benefits that would come from doing the same at other intervals, like a whole day or a weekend, like your personal retreat thing. So having more time would in retrospect, give you more clarity for bigger things as well. Yep, absolutely. And what's interesting about this section is that there is a couple different spotlights, for lack of a better term. One on chapter two on analytical clarity, where they talk about Dwight Eisenhower. And then chapter three, they talk about Jane Goodall, and that talks more about intuition. Backing up a little bit, chapter one is titled clarity and they use a phrase here they say leadership is not letting the immediate take precedence over the important that sounds a lot like important versus urgent that's what i thought too yeah the old eisenhower matrix yep yep <laughs> so very appropriate i think going into chapter two talking about dwight eisenhower although they never actually talk about that matrix specifically they do talk in that section about how Dwight Eisenhower had to make some really tough decisions. And in order to make them effectively, he would basically embrace solitude as much as he could. They use a lot of really cool personal examples, letters that he was writing to his wife, you know, where he says, even when I think I have a couple of hours to myself, something always happens to upset my plans, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but the thing I found interesting about Dwight Eisenhower specifically, because this is analytical clarity, which they make the point that this is the hardest kind to get. Uh, he had a habit of thinking by writing. Does that remind you of anything? The artist way? That was yeah. the first one that came to mind. Morning pages. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> now, I think I have given up entirely on the practice of morning pages. Oh, I gave up on that one a long time ago. <laughs> I do not have the time for that, yep. especially anymore when I've been focusing more on sleep, save last night, but, you know, focusing more on sleep by getting up in the morning, 
trying to do my Bible reading, trying to, you know, do a morning kickoff in my bullet journal, getting breakfast for the kids, all the things. It's like, I don't have time. I don't like, it takes yep. 30 minutes or more sometimes to do that. It's like, I, it's just not that important. Yeah. But I, I think there is a connection to be made there. And essentially that's what Dwight Eisenhower is doing. Although he's not doing it maybe in the morning, he's doing it sure. whenever he can find some, some time. Uh, and so there is, I think a little bit of an incentive there for me to start trying to think through things by writing. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like for me yet. I don't have an action item associated with that specifically, but that's an example of the kind of thing we were just talking about where it's like, okay, there's a real connection here between him writing to untangle his thoughts, Julia Cameron's the artist way, which I'm sure they're familiar with. And they just kind of leave us hanging of like, this is what Dwight Eisenhower did. He wrote all these letters. Yeah. Yeah. That's I don't true. want to write letters. So how do I apply this? If I hadn't read the artist way, I have no idea what morning pages are like, where do I even begin with this? Right. Right. You know, and it'd be really easy to say, oh, in the artist way, Julia Cameron says, just stream of conscious writing. So you sit down and you write whatever comes to your mind. And that's a way of untangling things. Boom. Done. You know, a sentence or two. And now we've got something solid that we can build off of. But yeah, there were, there were a couple things that I noticed that were overarching across the book. Number one, they have a fascination with uh, the Civil War. Yes, they do. <laughs> they, they love the I'm Civil okay War. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm fine with that, but they just, there's an inordinate amount of stories from that period. Uh, the second is that a lot of people from that time period processed and thought on paper, which we don't do. We do it, uh, sometimes we do it through keyboards, but we don't do that on paper very often yep. this is where i of course gravitate towards that as somebody who runs a membership site called analog joe <laughs> so <laughs> like and that's part of what we're gonna we're getting ready to talk about let's see as this releases it's in another this next wednesday as this releases uh we're gonna be talking about like new year stuff and processing your thoughts and reflecting on paper like that's what we're gonna talk about exactly yep. and this was like fuel to the fire for that because so many people in here process, like you're saying, on paper and wrote things out, and that's how they got their thoughts together. And what? How's the phrase go? Thoughts disentangle themselves over lips and pencil tips. Like that's yep. there's something to that for sure. This is partly why we have bookworm. We can process it out loud. So yes, there's a lot of writing. It's like I don't do that. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Maybe I should. I don't know. It's it's inspiring to at least maybe try it. Um, but, you know, going back to our point of, you know, what are you supposed to get from these stories? You know, some of me wonders if they don't want to set you up for that so that you can gravitate towards the ones that fit you. Maybe. Sure. I would love for them to just say that. It would take three sentences and you'd be done. But <laughs> it is it is interesting. So, yeah, that's one of them that stuck out to me. It's like, okay, should I be doing this? I'm probably not going to take the time for it, but probably should. Well, the other interesting thing about this, I think, is you're right. A lot of people that they focused on obviously did this paper pen, but 2020 was the the year of the Zettelkasten. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's an understatement. Whether you are a room research fan, there it is. I knew not, it was coming. Yeah, I was trying to figure out a way to walk around that one, but I couldn't. <laughs> so now that we've talked about it, I think this is part of the value of applications like Rome and Obsidian. And I think we're going to see this more and more in other note-taking apps is the ability to go back and resurface in the appropriate context things that you had written previously. Because I think there is value in the stream of conscious writing, getting it out of your head onto the paper, but also once you've gotten it onto the paper, in this case, digital paper, being able to see that again and see those things pop up over and over again, I think there is insight to be had from that too. So like just getting it down is sort of level one and then being able to see all of your thoughts on this thing at a time and look at all those thoughts and how they connect, that's kind of level two. And that has a lot of uh, a lot of benefit to not just this first section clarity, but also the next one, which we're going to talk about creativity, 
Before we get there though, just real briefly, chapter three, they talk about intuition. I think it's worth calling out here how intuition and analytical clarity are kind of like two different sides of the coin and how analytical clarity, this is the one where you get away and you think about things and you get really focused on the problem you're trying to solve. But intuition actually kind of works the opposite way. You still need the solitude. You still need to get alone. But instead of having a focused approach, it's more like the panoramic view. And you see, but sometimes without even being able to clarify what you're seeing, the big picture. And then you're like, yeah, I just don't feel like this is the right decision to make. And so right. you do something right. else instead. Yes. So let's let's go ahead and step into the creativity side of it. I feel like this is maybe one that we've heard a lot of in the past. If you can't come up with a solution to something, go off on your own and it'll come like that. There, I just summarized three chapters. But the <laughs> <laughs> well, the, two chapters. <laughs> well, that's right. This one's two. Yeah. Um, I I will say this is one that I use a lot in a very very small way, but it's very common for me to be stuck on say a code project. I don't know what the answer is to how to solve that, but I step away from whatever it is I'm doing, go for a walk, do something else that involves working with my hands always by myself and I come back to it and I almost always have an answer and can solve whatever it was I was stuck on. That's exactly what we're talking about here in that if you are trying to come up with a solution to something that you don't currently have that solution, implementing some solitude will not always, but in most cases at least get you on the path towards a solution. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, they make the point in chapter four here that solitude is where we find revelation. That's kind of what you were just talking about. Uh, one other thing from chapter four specifically that I thought was interesting is they talk about uh, that people try hard to copy what other people do because there's so much information available to us. I never really thought of this this way. Uh, we have mentioned many, many, many times Steal Like an Artist by Austin Kleon. <laughs> you have. I've yes. still never read this, so... We're going to have to read it. You should pick that <laughs> book. Um, but the basic idea there is you don't have to be worried about ripping somebody off because all those dots you collect, they're going to be synthesized in your head and they're going to come out as something original anyways. But this kind of completes the picture for me because it's basically saying that in order for that to happen, you do have to have the solitude. You will end up just mimicking somebody else if all you're doing is consuming information. You can get the information and you can spit it back out, but in order for it to really become something that is authentically you, there needs to be this solitude piece for the creative process to work. And it's not even something like do X then Y and you'll get Z. It's really just get solitude and then your brain will take care of the rest, <laughs> which I think is, is kind of cool. Yeah, it really is. And it, I, you know, it's absolutely right. How many times have you heard the stories of people who failed or rejected hundreds or thousands of times before they had a success? You hear those stories, you know, how many times we hear that story in the books that we read. So it's very common. You, you hear it a lot. I think that plays into this. You know, if I'm consuming RSS feeds and just scrolling Twitter and scrolling Facebook and all the things, like you're consuming all this. Yes, you have a lot of ideas. You can research things to the nth degree and collect the dots that you can then connect later. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to create an original dot, per se, unless you're regularly creating. And it's when you create the original dot that things really blow up. Yeah, and you won't even really have the ideas, I, I would argue, until you have some built-in solitude. So this is something right. I've been thinking about because I've been thinking about like time tracking and the work that I do at the Sweet Setup. And that time where I'm just letting my brain connect things, how do I track that time? Sure. Is it like research time? I'm not really researching. And if you have to think of the work that you do through the lens of defining to somebody what you are working on 
how do you say the solitude piece where I was spending four hours just thinking that's actually part of the process? <laughs> they're yeah. like, well, I don't want to pay you for that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I struggled with that when I was doing contracting all the time. I figure out how to solve your problems while I'm mowing the lawn, but you for sure will not be paying me to mow my lawn. Yep. I can't bill that time, but that's where I solved your problem. So how do I incorporate that? Usually it's by upcharging 25%. So yeah. like you do something like that to make up for when you're actually working off hours. So it, it's messy. It really is. And how do you do that on a regular basis? You can't go mow your lawn every single day. No, no. <laughs> but if that's the solitude, well, <laughs> that if that's the place where things click, you should be looking to do that, I would argue, more than once a week. Right. So uh, I've been thinking about that, and I don't have any specific answers yet, but I empathize for people who are in a situation where you're being measured by what you are able to produce because there's a tendency to be like, oh, well, you wrote that article. Well, that took, you know, five hours to write that article. But you didn't see the 25 hours of noodling that needed to happen before the five-hour article got written. Right. And I guess as I'm reading this, I feel less bad about that being my process because it, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not weird. <laughs> 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 there are more like me <laughs> yeah but i still don't have anything solid on like well what do i call that time and how sure. do i incorporate that into my regular time blocking i'm not quite sure what to do with that yet but i recognize that it's a it's an important piece of my creative process going forward yeah this is actually a big reason i've stepped away from a lot of contracting and commission work because trying to bill it is such a mess like, I get that it can be lucrative. You can make good money at it. But because I was somewhat forced out of it and now have been trying to rebuild some things outside of that concept, it's significantly freeing to be able to work on content, but then it doesn't matter how, like, if you can do the recurring passive thing, because then that doesn't matter. You know, yes, you get paid whenever you kick out content and such, but you have the freedom to step away, do some solitude, mow the lawn, blow snow. Like I, one of the things that they've tried to get me to offload to somebody else at my day job is my uh, weekly process of tearing down the stage and rebuilding it for the next week from a sound system stance. Yeah, and because they don't like paying me to do that because like you know any you know a high school student could do that. You are absolutely correct, but I want that task <laughs> because it takes about an hour and a half, maybe a little bit more. It takes a little bit of time to do that. And as a result of that, I get a lot of clarity on the projects I'm working on because of it. So yep, I want that time. Don't take it from me. <laughs> <laughs> and that hour and a half, I mean... You have some other stuff that you're maybe getting clarity on too at the same Correct. time. So maybe yep. that's where it gets a little bit sticky. But from a boss's perspective, they're probably thinking, oh, well, we can get back an hour and a half of Joe's time by removing this task. No, you probably just stole three hours from Joe because you're not letting him think through the work that he's doing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You're going you're gonna to take that task from me and to replace it, I'm going to walk the building for an hour and a half. <laughs> or you're just going to sit down and try to do what you need to do and you're going to be stuck. Correct. And I'll be stuck for five hours. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it's a delicate dance, isn't it? I mean, it really it is. is. It is. And I think everybody is unique in what you need to do and how much time you need to make things click. But I wish there was a way to just make it simple. Right. Like, right. This is time spent in this category, and this is how much benefit I got from it. It's not easy to say, well, this random idea I had that I haven't tested or done anything with yet, I have no idea how valuable that thing is. So I can't say this is what you're getting in return for 
the hours that I spend doing this. Right, right. So we've got the two points here, clarity and then creativity. The third one is emotional balance. And this one and the next one are a little bit harder to, I guess, quantify. The first two are pretty straightforward. Like, I'm gonna go off on my own, get clarity on this specific situation so I can make a better decision. I can't solve my problem. I'm gonna go off and spend some time by myself or doing something else. That way I can get some, uh, some better potential solutions for that. Emotional balance is a little harder to, I guess, quantify in this case, because it's if you have an extreme emotion, fear is probably a big one or angst or anxiousness. Like those are worries. Like those are big issues that could be overwhelming. Yeah. But they're making the argument through these stories, I would say, that again, being willing to separate from the situation. I think about some of the war scenarios where it's very dire, the situation that they're looking at. The general steps away from it and can, you know, let all the emotion subside and then step back into the situation with a clear head. That's a lot of what they're talking about here. At least that's the way I understood it. So again, emotional balance, whenever you've got the overwhelming emotions, giving yourself time for that solitude can give you a better, you know, it's kind of a messy line there too, between clarity too. Like mm -hmm. it, it can help you get some clear thinking on what's going on, but they're calling it emotional balance because of the situation that you're trying to get clear thinking on. It can go either way. Yeah. This one is complicated. Um, <clears throat> they, they mentioned in the, the chapter on emotional balance specifically that the uh, the fact that your emotions get out of whack is not necessarily a bad thing. They mentioned that every leader has their emotional limits. There's no shame in exceeding them. What distinguishes effective leaders from ineffective ones is their ability to restore their emotional balance, and that helps them make appropriate decisions. One of the chapters I talk about here, Abraham Lincoln, General Meade, he's got General Lee cornered. The Potomac River is... Uh, flooding so they can't cross it the bridge has been blown up he's basically a sitting duck if they capture him the war is over but they had just fought the battle of gettysburg and all his men were burned out and he was burned out and he's listening me inserting details here you know he's probably listening to his men being upset about the guys that they lost uh, and even though they outnumber lee's troops and like they can end this thing right now they don't recognize the opportunity that's before them Lincoln's like, hey, get your butt over there and and finish this. And they wait and they wait and they wait. And then they decide to go finally. And they had crossed the river like three hours before and they lost their their chance. They had escaped to, to Virginia. And uh, there's a bunch of lessons to be learned from that specifically. The, the thing there I think that they don't really address is that General Meade, had he been a more emotionally balanced leader, maybe he recognizes the fact that they lost a bunch of men in the battle of gettysburg but quickly is able to write that and say you know i know this is terrible but we have an opportunity here guys let's just get this over with that didn't happen and then abraham lincoln that's the one that they focus on he's a really really upset <laughs> right that this didn't end and instead of like berating this guy he writes a letter puts it in an envelope and says not signed not sent <laughs> which that's pretty brilliant, I think. And again, is one of those things where like, that's a tactic that you could use, but they don't really describe, you know, how this might look in modern day. They're just focused on telling Abraham Lincoln's cool story. Uh, but I think this is something that I used to beat myself up about is the fact that I would get upset about things. And he's basically saying like, well, that's normal. It's just how quickly you bounce back. And I'm thinking back specifically to uh, a couple of years ago when I found myself getting let go and not knowing what's going to happen and uh, being pretty upset about the whole situation. Uh, being able to navigate through that and come out kind of like a better person, that is actually a huge win. Um, there's a topic in this 
section called post-traumatic growth, which I had never heard before. Obviously heard of PTSD, and that's obviously the negative application of this trauma. And I'm not negating that that's a very real thing. But I feel like there's a valuable perspective shift that can happen here when you recognize that I'm in this trauma, I don't want to be here, but there's an opportunity to grow because of this. And I can say that, I guess, because I went through that and it was a pretty tough financial uh, financial time for, for my wife and I. Um, I got pretty depressed about it, to be honest. Uh, I don't really talk about the details of that with really anybody, but I look back at it now and I can realize that I was not in a great place, but stuff happened and I made it through and like with the whole COVID-19 thing and the economy and I, I don't want to, I don't want to belittle the things that have happened, but uh, the, the stuff with the, the economy specifically, I know a lot of people lost their jobs and I was thinking about that my, myself when it all happened is like, well, what's the, the worst thing that can, can happen here from an economic perspective specifically? It's like, well, you can lose your job. And I'm like, oh, been there, done that. Is that the yeah. worst? That <laughs> right. It's not as bad. As I, I thought. Yeah, <laughs> I, I got that. Like, what else? <laughs> yeah. Yep. And so that was kind of a, a point where I recognized that I kind of went through this post-traumatic growth. And I their definition of this post-traumatic growth is when you come out of the experience, a more placid, gentle, positive person. And I think that in a small way, that has happened to me because of that specific scenario. And so uh, I think this is a, a very real thing that I didn't have a term for before reading this. And I like that, that section. They also say running is cheaper than therapy. And I can hundred percent agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a very valid point. <laughs> it's way easier to go outside, go for a walk, run through the woods, hiking, yep. all those things. It's way, 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 way cheaper than talking to a psychologist. Just say <laughs> one visit will pay for your shoes. <laughs> the last part here, because I want to spend a little bit of time on the, the little practical piece, but the last part is moral courage. And this is where there's conversations around Martin Luther King. You know, that, that concept where you're trying to make decisions or trying to get your head around a decision or an action that needs to be taken that is very likely to have a lot of pushback, will have a lot of people upset because you made that decision or taken that action. So you're gathering the courage through your solitude and trying to get, again, clarity on what that decision or action should be. But you're ultimately trying to build up the courage to act on your morals in that case. So do you have a better way to explain that? This is another one of those that's a little bit messy to get your head around. Uh, I don't really have a better definition, but I'll try off the cuff here. <laughs> they mentioned that some decisions bring consequences that are more than professional. So essentially, moral courage is taking a stand for something and knowing that you are probably going to get a more than reciprocal negative response for doing so. So you mentioned Martin Luther King Jr. That's one of the chapters in here. I really liked the chapter in this section on Winston Churchill. Uh, this the, the TLDR here is that Neville Chamberlain went to Munich to try to prevent Hitler from declaring another world war. And basically just bent over backwards and gave him everything that he wanted regarding Czechoslovakia and then came back and everybody hailed him as a hero saying, Hey, you did it. Even though all he did was say, yes, sir. You know, to <laughs> everything Hitler wanted, right. You avoided right. the war, you know, and, and a couple days later, Winston Churchill gets up in the, the meeting and he says, this is a very bad thing. We're going to pay for this down the road. And everybody's like, oh, how could you say that? And obviously he was right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because Hitler changed the terms again and again and again. And then, yeah, 
he's Hitler. He's a crazy guy. You know, you're yes. never gonna you're never gonna appease him. You can, we do not negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> Churchill That's was kinda... very good at figuring out what people's <laughs> motives were. Like he knew yeah. that. So. Yeah. And this is like that's the definition of that that term we talked about in um oh, what was that book? The Chris Voss book. You do actually negotiate with terrorists. But basically this guy was so irrational that you couldn't come to an agreement and be like there. Now those parameters are set. Like he was always going to change the rules to to try to get more and no one recognized that except for churchill and when he pointed right. it out he was not popular shall we say right at least at first never split the difference that you're thinking yep. of never split the difference that's it yeah he was not super popular at first people don't realize that they think oh churchill churchill no not 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 well loved from the get-go but again churchill had a lot of practices that helped him get some courage to stand up and to intuit what's going on. I guess that's that's a term we haven't talked about much, but they do reference intuition quite a bit Yeah, through these parts that whenever you can step away, a lot of times you, you may not be able to articulate what you think. Moral courage maybe has more of this than some of the others. So you may not be able to verbalize your action rationale, I guess, would be the term for it. But sure. you have that intuition to where you know, like you know that this is the right move. You just can't tell anybody why, which is sometimes hard. To, like, no, you just have to listen to me. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe not even like be able to tell people why, but not being able to assign proper values to the reasons behind it like no one can really understand why this thing is so important to you right right that's kind of the gist of the story on martin luther king jr they basically get to the point in that story where he's kind of a reluctant participant in all of this stuff and in the back of his mind he's like my wife and my daughter are gonna suffer because of my involvement in this and then he's getting death threats. These people say, we're going to blow up your house in a couple of days if you don't knock this off. And that night, like, he's up all night praying. And when he, the next morning, basically, he's got he's got it resolved in his his heart. He's like, okay, I'm, I'm going all in with this. And from that moment forward, he's kind of like, I don't really care what the costs are. From this point forward... I am 100% involved with the, the cause. And that's really the, the thing that people remember when they think of Martin Luther King Jr. Right. Is that post all night prayer session when he resolved, like, this is what I need to do. The story that they tell up until that point, he's kind of like, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess, isn't there someone else? <laughs> and my how history could have been very different if he would have just gotten to the point where he was like this is enough right. I, I don't need to right. do this anymore let somebody else without a wife and a kid at home let them make that sacrifice because i don't really want to do that yes all right so these are the four parts clarity creativity emotional balance moral courage like we've talked about these are all stories with very little connecting and very little explanation in them and around them. But there is this last eight page section, Embracing Solitude, where there's like a practical, here's what you should do, kind of. I preface that because it's not cut and dry, I would say, as to far as like what you should do. <laughs> One. In the beginning part of this, and I pulled it up here so I could see it, but I, I haven't seen this, but people often refer to the information age. Yeah. And he used another term for it, the input age. Yeah, which I, true. I hadn't heard that term before, and it made a whole lot of sense to me. Like I prefer that over the information age just because there's so much stuff that you 
see and read that really isn't information. Like it's just junk. <laughs> yeah. So there's things just trying to grab your attention and it's an input, but it's not necessarily information. So yeah, I do like that, that different terminology for it. So I'm probably going to stick with that one. Um, but he does have a solid point there just in that very brief section that because of that constant input, the constant flood, we don't do the solitude practice as much as we used to like we were talking earlier people used to process on paper we just don't do that anymore you know even if it's over a keyboard it doesn't matter like we just don't do that maybe the zettelkasten thing will take over but i don't expect it to be so widespread that it will change the culture as a result of a zettelkasten but this section starts off with a conversation about creating solitude at work and in my head, all I saw was deep work, deep work, deep work, <laughs> deep work. That's what I saw <laughs> as yeah. he was explaining all this. You know, setting expectations so that other people know what you're doing, uh, finding space for it. Like, this is, it's Cal Newport through and through. That's that's what I saw there. <laughs> it is Cal Newport through and through. It's not just deep work, though. I think there's a time blocking piece to this. Oh, sure. Yeah. Page 182, he says, scheduling a leader's time is a zero sum game. But again, no mention of time blocking. <laughs> Correct. Yes. Which Cal Newport's latest book is the time block planner. Yep. Which is actually pretty cool. I have one. I am not going to use it because I still time block my day old school in my fancy notebook. Sure. But that's the big idea here from creating solitude at work is finding space for the solitude by scheduling it during your day. And I don't like the definition of this as creating solitude at work. This is just creating solitude. <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> the work piece, I get that if you're in an office environment, maybe this is a little bit harder to do, and but maybe it's even more important. I don't know. Maybe it's even more valuable to give people some step-by-step -step on how to do this, which is noticeably absent here. <laughs> but I don't know, that distinction I feel like is artificial. So the other thing I, I want to mention here regarding the Zettelkasten thing in the input age that you mentioned a little bit ago, I feel like the Zettelkasten popularity is directly tied to the information overload that people are experiencing and they define in this book. People are looking for more meaning between all of the inputs in their lives. I am putting my flag in the ground right now though, that a year, two years, five years from now, there will be so many people who say, yeah, that Zettelkast and stuff just doesn't work. And the reason it's not gonna work is because no one has turned off the fire hose of useless information. There are going to be tons of people who try programs like Rome and Obsidian and all the other backlinking stuff. And they're going to say, there, I got backlinks. I got a Zellcast. And no, no. What you have is a bunch of linked garbage. You have to have the right things go in and you need solitude in order to identify what those important things are, which is why I really like my hybrid system where the the paper stuff forces me to slow down and the stuff I capture there, not all of it gets actually into my Rome database. And that's a good thing because it means the stuff that's in there is more valuable. And so I think there's going to be like a huge flood of people who are right now because every application out there is adding these sorts of features to connect things. They're going to connect all these things and they're going to say, there, I connected things, but I still don't have any more ideas or any better ideas. Well, I guess this thing just doesn't work. And they're never going to realize that really they are the problem. It is user error. <laughs> well, I've already been going down this road. You, you, you've, you've known me in this area. Like I, I've been telling people for a little while now, you don't need a Zettelkasten. I mean, people sing its praises, but I've been saying like, you don't need this. What I've been offering and what we've talked about, you know, through you know, it's kind of an undertone in some of the, I don't mean to keep bringing up Analog Joe, but some of the webinars we've done for AnalogJoe.com. Like, we've had this weave through. It's like, okay, having a Zettelkasten isn't necessarily the right answer. It has more to do with turning off Twitter, turning off the news feeds, and creating things. 
Like that's that's what it comes down to. Now, creating is a very very loose term whenever we talk about it. It has more to do with just being willing to make either things in physical realms. You're doing woodworking or you're replumbing a house. I don't know what it is. Something along those lines. You could be making content online. Like it's easy for like content creators in general have full control over their schedule generally. So they're going to talk about things like Zettelkastens and the tools that they use because they have full control over it. I don't. My schedule and who has access to me and what tools I use, I don't control 100%. So I am forced to use things like Microsoft Teams. I still think it's garbage, but I still use it. <laughs> Which is fine. I mean, this is kind of a discussion then about the tools. I do think the Zettelkasten is an effective tool. It is an effective tool for thinking and connecting thoughts. However, just because you have a tool doesn't mean that you know how to use it. And that's the thing, you know, Funky Mosquito mentions in the chat that people follow trends and that is what is happening here. But I guess what I'm saying is that embracing the tool without the perspective renders the tool useless. And people are going to write off this tool as useless and they're going to have no idea what they actually had in their hands. <laughs> and you don't need the Zettelkasten, to your point, in order to be creative. You can use other tools. You can use other things to capture notes and develop them. There are other things that you can use to develop ideas. Mind, uh, mind maps are a, a great thing for that. And I've kind of cobbled together my own system with all the different pieces. Ultimately, that's what you got to figure out how to do. But it just kind of makes me, on one hand, it makes me sad. On one hand, I kind of laugh. Where like, I see all these people who are trying all these backlinks and they're like, there, I got my Zettelkast. And I'm like, no, no, you really don't. You have backlinked <laughs> drafts that you have to manually connect. Yeah. That's not the same thing. Sure. And then even if they, they do add the automatic backlinking, then like there, got my Zettelkast. And I'm like, well, what is all in your database? And I see all these grocery lists and things. And I'm like, no, no, that's not it either. <laughs> like the quality of the ideas is really what we're, we're after here. And I think that that is relevant to this whole discussion of leadership and solitude too. I mean, some of these stories, which we didn't really talk about, like Lawrence of Arabia back in chapter five, he came down with a sickness and had to sit in his tent for 10 days. And then he had this crazy idea, which ended up winning the, the war for them. And it was sort of the same thing with uh, Ulysses S. Grant, how he's sitting in his room at the Magnolia and for days. And then he comes out with this crazy plan and everybody's like, I don't think this is going to work. And then it, <laughs> it ends up working and turning the, the tide of the, the war. I mean, you can have those ideas and without the solitude piece, you don't even recognize what you have. Right. You, you have to, the, the solitude in my opinion, what it does is it helps you to see things for what they really are. And I kind of hesitate to even think about all the ideas that I've had that I never really gave much thought to and just quickly dismissed and forgot about them and they're gone forever now. Like, what all did I get rid of <laughs> sure. in my haste, you know, in my, my uh, hesitance to embrace solitude and margin, I think is relevant to this discussion too. That's another, another form of this, I feel. So this is definitely something that I am a champion for the cause at at this point uh, when it comes to embracing solitude after reading this book however going back to this last section i what are they even telling me to do here <laughs> think about things identify my first principles find a higher purpose i don't know D does this strike you as odd that this is like a bullet list at the end. Now I should, I should, I guess, preface this by saying I actually have a course for faith-based productivity, which is 20 something videos on this specific topic. 
So I feel a little bit slighted that they're trying to just cram this in at the end at the beginning, probably. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Well, having, you know, having gone through that, it's weird that they bullet pointed it the way they did at the end. I, I, I would agree with you. That was kind of strange. But you know me, I tend to generalize things. And with this sort of book, I feel like it does very well. Like the way my brain operates connects with this, I think significantly better than what yours does. Just from listening to you, I'm making that assumption and putting words in your mouth. But to me, like I'm, I'm seeing all these potential benefits from solitude. Solitude might mean something like a personal retreat. It could mean the 10 minutes I've got on my drive. It could mean once in a while, whenever I can't think clearly, going for a walk in the woods. Like It could mean a lot of different things. To me, I felt like I came out of this with, I don't have an action plan. I have no action items for this. But I expect that having gone through this, I'm probably going to be implementing solitude more often without realizing that this book is the result of that. Sure. So I, I feel like there's a bit of a, this is one of those that, yes, there's a lot of motivation here. There's very little application at the end that's kind of hard to get your head around if you want a practical tactical step and system. I don't know that they need a system for it, but that's why I feel like it's kind of hard to grasp what's going on. Sure. They don't really want to give you a system. I'm kind of getting into style and reading here. So like, they're not wanting to go into that. At least I didn't feel like they wanted to, to give you that. They want it more open-ended so that you can make decisions about what's important to you. And in my case, I think that that's a good thing that they did that because I have mentally, I've extrapolated it out into a lot of different minor scenarios, even some that they don't talk about at all, like, like minute systems. Like whenever I'm trying to write something or I'm trying to code something and such, I generally want to do that at a standing desk scenario. The reason being, sure. it's common for me to write a sentence and a half, not have the right word, and then I step away from my computer and, and take a couple steps back and forth, and then I step back to it, and then I oh, keep yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, and it's that 15 seconds there, which I would call solitude in a way, but they don't really talk about that type of thing at all. That's not discussed. So, you know, there's another way that that can be brought into this. So anyway, I... I think I have expanded it a little bit from what they intended because they didn't give me the specifics there. So, yeah, I don't know. I would say that's a positive thing. But again, for the average person, the average Joe, <laughs> uh, I don't know how that would pan out. I, I can't speak to that one. Uh, the fact that you have no action items from this book I know. proves its failure as a book. <laughs> in my opinion <laughs> sure not saying that joe you really need some solitude but i feel like the message here is so important and it's so critical and the whole idea of leadership even if it's just a small team or even if it's just your family or even if it's just yourself this is like we are who they are trying to speak to and the fact that they spoke to you, they made their arguments, you're not quite sure what to do, and so you do nothing? I'm not faulting you. I totally understand right, right. how people can have that approach after reading this book. But that just makes me sad because there is, I feel like, a bunch of gold in here. There's a bunch of stuff that we didn't even talk about regarding leadership that I think is is really, really good. Like they talk about leadership is consensual interdependence. You can't just command people. Leaders uh, choose to depend on their followers and their followers choose to depend on their leaders. Like there's so much stuff like that that's just so good in here. And yes. I agree with you that because there's no, well, this is how you do this sort of thing. The easy thing at the end is just to be like, well, let's put that one on the shelf and move on. I'll figure this out on my own later. <laughs> Right. <laughs> but we yep. both know that like that's not going to happen later. Maybe it'll have like you were the standing desk example. That's a really good one. So I'm glad that you at least have like thought through that sort of thing. 
but I really like what I'm sad about as I'm talking through this is like missed opportunity here for championing the cause of, of solitude. It's almost like you attend a conference and you see somebody who's presenting a, a talk that you've done a bunch, bunch of research for, but they've got a really big audience and a really big following. And so you're really excited that they're talking about this thing and you go attend the talk and they just kind of like tiptoe around the real issues and yeah. it's kind of lands with a thud and you're just like, oh, I could have done a better job. <laughs> Not saying that I would have done a better job, but at least like there's that thing inside of me that's like, let me try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let me see if I can write something about solitude and give Joe yeah. an action item. <laughs> now, I will say, since we're talking about action items, I, I don't have anything that I wrote down, but I think some of that is because I haven't, practiced the thing that they're promoting in solitude because my sense is like it's it's a chicken and egg scenario for me right now in that I feel like I need to do some form of an extended solitude period so that I could get my head around what to do with solitude like that's kind of how I feel right now sure thus no action items because I haven't had the time to process <laughs> what those should be and the so, problem there is know. when is that gonna happen right i mean as the person who wrote the personal retreat handbook it's easy for me to say we'll just get away for a day do a personal right. retreat and you'll right. figure it out in the busyness of the day-to-day -day, i understand why that's not feasible for a lot of people my day job won't let me do that so exactly so what does somebody like joe do right now what's one thing they can do from this book to start regaining solitude that is gone <laughs> Well, you know, if I want to be, you know, devil's advocate on myself here, the thing that you, that I could do, I'm probably not going to choose to do this right now, but I could give up some of the work I do at night after the girls go to bed and just spend that hour, hour and a half on my own. Mm. I could easily do that. I could go for a walk that time of night. It would be cold, probably good for me, but I could do that, but I don't, and I don't plan to. You could start running with me. I'm not running to Minnow to uh, Wisconsin just to go running. With you. <laughs> That'd be a long run. Here, you run to me, I'll run to you. I'll meet you in the middle. Like <laughs> I went running in the snow the other day. This is totally a side tangent, but uh, I got these. They're called Yak Tracks. Okay. They have little metal springs and metal yep. spikes on them, so you don't kill yourself when running on the ice. And yep. they work really, really well. <laughs> nice. I feel like I would somehow like sit on the side of my shoe, and it would. <laughs> I would just biff it. <laughs> oh, we should do style and rating. Um, Hold on. I got a couple action items here. You do? There's nothing I in do. the outline. Uh, sorry. I forgot to update the outline. I've been on sabbatical before this. That's got it. Excuse. Got it. Okay. They're not you major. You have a couple. Uh, in chapter one, they shared an example of somebody who was color coding their journal entries based on their emotional response. Do you remember that story? Mm. It was like, if I feel good about this thing, I'm going to color code it green. If I feel bad about this, when it happens, it's red. If I'm not sure, I'm going to make it purple. Yep. I don't know exactly how to do this inside of Rome research, but Rome is what I'm using now for all of my journal. Why would stuff. you put it in Rome? Uh, I have a whole article for you. <laughs> No, you don't. <laughs> yes, I do. I actually just, just published this. I should tell you, I am still on Rome's newsletter. They still send me their newsletter. I have unsubscribed from that thing, I think, three times, and they continue to send it to me. Oh, they're a bunch of jerks. Absolutely. <sighs> but they're like on the edge of when I when I've had other companies do that, I send a bot <laughs> after them to shut the thing down so it'll stop sending it to me, and I am so close to unleashing it on them, which is not... I shouldn't do that, but oh, it's making me mad. Oh no, I'm not logged in. I can't post the the link here. Give me a second. One. I'm gonna have to edit all this. Good job, me. Oh my gosh, Twitch just sent me a verification code via email. <laughs> <sighs> Gotta log in to chat. <laughs> Here, you do that. I gotta step away for a second. All right.
Who knows when Joe's coming back? Yes, that is a problem. People want to do everything with these tools uh, because they can do a lot of different stuff, but they shouldn't do a bunch of different things. You should use them in specific ways that are a net positive for you. That's always my argument. So when it came to journaling, I was trying to solve a specific problem, and that is what is in the, uh, the link that I shared there. Is um, I wanted a way to review my journal entries that was better than clicking on every single one of them inside of day one. So the metadata in Rome allows me to do that. All right, I will actually share this explanation here when Joe comes back. All right, can't hear you, you're still muted. You don't need to hear me. There we go. All right, I'm gonna clap. To give what you need, that way you can see the spike. Maybe. Cool. Did you get your right. link? I did. So. The link there that talks about the ways that I'm using Rome Research. And I started using it with the daily questions because I had a specific pain point I was trying to solve. And that was, I had all these things regarding the prompts inside of day one, but I have to go to the journal, tap on an entry. It's in a markdown table. So I gotta tap another button in order to render the code. And now I can see the table with my responses. And if I was gonna review those, which I want to do as part of the personal retreat, I have to open up every single one, go back, open the next one, go back, open the next one. I can't see them in line. So what Rome does is, is it allows me to use metadata and just get all of these things linked on like the daily questions page. I open them all up and you can kind of see that in the, the link that I shared. But I also watched Drew's video on using Rome for journaling and he inspired me to do a couple other things. So I've started using it for daily gratitude and then also journal entries, which I'll do typically when I finish something that I feel is kind of substantial. So like when we finish recording this episode, I will make a journal entry, just one or two sentences about how it went, how I'm feeling, whatever. And then uh, I'll put all of that stuff on the daily notes page. The daily notes page is kind of the anchor. And what I love about Rome is that I can see all that stuff in line without having to worry about where I'm sticking it. I don't have to say this goes in this journal, this goes in that journal. Right. This is metadata, click the link, boom, there's everything. So that's why I'm doing it in Rome. Although I would argue that Rome is not the right place for probably 90% of people who are looking for a journaling solution. Uh, it's perfect for what I want to do with it though. That's the thing. Like I, I keep looking for reasons to leave Rome <laughs> and they are there, but it just hits the mark for the, the stuff that I want to do. So there I am. Rome Regarding is the next journaling, though, We will see. It's, Regarding it's journaling think. though, the thing I'm trying to figure out is this color coding. I know you can do like highlights. I'm not sure I want to do highlights inside a room. I could do tags. I really don't know if this is something that will stick for me, but I do kind of want to try this out and see if there's a way for me to, to implement this, which is kind of timely for me anyways, because new year and I've been spending a lot of time, I wrote that article thinking about the ways that I want to journal more regularly in 2021. Uh, I've got another one which is related and that is get more regular about journaling. And actually that's kind of happened already, but I want to continue the motivation that I have with this consistent journaling. Again, in that article, I make the case that I feel I just couldn't do it with the tool I was using and Rome kind of removes that friction for me, but we'll see. Maybe I'll hit another, another snag. Those are my two action items and they're very minor. Neither of them are really related to solitude, which is why I said what I said at the beginning about like, there's tons of action items to be had here. Just you need some more context in order to apply anything from this book. Okay. One thing I, I have a complaint about with you trying to put things in Rome, I, I'm convinced people are using Rome with the whole collector's fallacy. Like they're just dumping tons of stuff in it and there's not yeah. really anything they get out of it. And I've been asking a lot of folks that tell me they're big into Rome. It's like, okay, 
you're putting all that into Rome. What are you getting out of it? When do you go through that? When is your what is your schedule for getting value out of that stuff you're dumping into it? And I would challenge you to do the same thing. Like it's part of my personal retreat. It already if you're is. going to dump all your emotional tracking stuff in there, like I hope yep. you have a process for pulling it back out. But I would also argue is like something like that is very data heavy and putting it into a writing tool is a terrible idea. See, there's the thing. Rome is not a writing tool. I've tried to mm. use it for writing. It is not a good writing tool. You know what I mean? Like note yeah. type. Yeah. I, I don't mean long form writing. I mean, you know yep. what I mean? I get what you're saying. And I agree <laughs> that that's where, totally where this falls down for 99.99% of people. I am the personal retreat guy. So that's my anchor. <laughs> that's why I started yeah. to put stuff in there in the first place. I wanted the ability to go in there for the last three months and see my journal entries in line as part of my personal retreat, <laughs> Yep. which, you know, I just went through that process. So I know it, it works for me, but again, like that's another thing where they mentioned it for that one guy, the Campbell soups guy, the whole idea of the personal retreat. I was upset when I read that and I was like, Oh, personal retreat. Duh. That should have been like, prevalent throughout the whole thing in my opinion you want to be a, an effective leader you gotta have a system like a personal retreat for getting away every couple of months and just recentering you don't sure. have to follow my format for it but you do need solitude that was my big takeaway from this entire book was the value of solitude and kind of like crystallizing for me why the personal retreat worked so well before reading this i was kind of like well i know it works and I think I kind of know why, but I really can't explain it. <laughs> and after reading this, I'm like, oh yeah, solitude. <laughs> sure, <laughs> makes sense. All right, I look forward to you reporting back on how your Rome experiment goes. All right, and we'll your do. journaling stuff. So style and rating, we've talked about the style stuff quite a bit here. And I, I don't want to reiterate things. Quick summary, he's a good writer. They are good writers. Stories are amazing. They are very well written. I feel that this is a collection of stories around a topic. And it's hard to, like we've been talking about, it's hard to gather like, okay, what's the purpose and what do I do with it? It's motivation without application to use those terms again. Yes. So all of that said, it could be better. I think it is fairly short for a book like this they have room for mm -hmm. it they could have put in chapter zero they could have put in a part five probably and and, ex and spelled it out they could have but chose not to yeah or ran out of time one of the two and it could have been there so uh from a rating i'll put it at 3.5 there's some good stuff in here i mean it's really good but it could be a lot better i think yes. so 3.5 it's an incredibly powerful message mistold through excellent storytelling. <laughs> That's how I feel about this. Yep. Uh, now, from a bookworm perspective, maybe that doesn't matter so much. Maybe you're sick of hearing us talk ad nauseum about all of these different morning pages and journaling and meditation and all the stuff that's in here. So from a bookworm perspective, if you have any sort of experience in the rest of the productivity genre and you have outside reference from, if you were to read this and you have those other books to draw on, going all the way back to How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler, you're able to read this through the lens of, I've read these other books on these topics and I can kind of fill in the holes that way. This is a great book. I am really glad that we read this. All my criticisms from this are in isolation to this book specifically. But in terms of, do I recommend you read it? I think absolutely. If nothing else, you will hear some really cool stories. <laughs> right, and right. you'll be motivated to figure out, maybe you won't spend a whole lot of time doing it. Uh, you'll be motivated by the idea. You'll at least have the thought, you know, I really should try to figure out if I can get some solitude in my, my daily routine. Uh, I'm going to rate this at 4.0 because I, as much as I railed on the lack of action items in the book, uh, again, I'm, I'm viewing this as like a valuable addition to my collection. 
And if you read any other books, which our bookworm uh, audience probably does, <laughs> right. then I think there's more value to be had here than if you read this book and just read this book. Sure. Also, I feel that these are the best stories I have ever read in any of the books that we have covered for Bookworm. Excellent, excellent mm -hmm. storytelling. And the more that I read books, the more I realize the value of stories. And I feel like the stories and the details that they give me in this book, these will come back to me. I just don't know how yet. And it's going to be valuable. You know, being able to recall Abraham Lincoln's emotional tirade, you know, in his room before writing that letter and never sending it. Yep. <laughs> that adds more detail to the next time I hear a story about Abraham Lincoln in the next book that we read or whatever. Right. And I, I don't know, again, you know, I don't know how you put a value on those sorts of things. So I'm just going to say, since I don't know what to, what to, assign to that i'm going to just assume that that's good and, and round up <laughs> sure no it makes sense would you say the stories here are better or better written than ryan holidays in stillness is the key because we said the same thing about that one we were just loved his stories because he was bringing out things we'd never seen or heard before how does this compare hmm that is a good question i can't recall a lot of specifics from those stories. I would have to look at Ryan Holiday's books to to respond appropriately, but my recollection is that he told great stories, but he focused on just the pieces that supported the argument that he was making. So that's great for trying to persuade somebody to your point of view that's not really the approach they took in this book. In this book, it was just, here's kind of the struggle that they're going through and some really cool details that kind of give you an inside look into like their character and what's going on in their life. And then you're left to make your own judgment um, from those, those stories. And I, I don't think one is better than the other. If I had to pick one that I personally liked better, I think... Maybe I like this approach in Lead Yourself First better, simply because I've got a large enough collection of dots to fall back on in making my own judgments. But if you want somebody to like tell you what the big takeaway is, you're going to be disappointed with these stories. You'll like sure. and Holidays better. Sure. Yeah, I think I would prefer Holidays. That's just me, though. All right. I'm good with putting this one on the shelf. So we got a 3.5 and a 4.0. Shelf it. What's next, Mike? Next is Discipline Equals Freedom by Jocko Willink, who is going to convince us to get up at 4.30 a.m. and work false. out every day. False. <laughs> false, false, false. <laughs> Good luck on that one. <laughs> the, it would be hilarious if he can encourage us to make an adjustment in one of those areas. I, I would say yep. it's a success on his part if he can do anything along those lines <laughs> oh great jocko fun. can get joe to have an action item <laughs> yeah that's we'll, we'll see we'll see <laughs> uh following that we discussed this before we jumped on uh to record uh the organized writer by anthony johnston mike and i have both been diving more into the writing space so we'll see we'll see how it pans out i've seen this one make the rounds for a while now multiple years it's been out for a while right um so yeah looking forward to that one it should be good i'm actually i think this has not been out for a while i pre-ordered this book out? uh maybe there was a version of this that was released a while back but this was a pre-ordered book that i got maybe six weeks ago eight weeks ago uh, maybe i'm so thinking it's of something really else new. then but Anthony Johnston has been around for a while as a, a writer, for sure. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Could be. This one should be fun, though. I've started this one. I think that uh, there may be some lively discussions from this. Chat tells us that 4.30 a.m. there's a lot of solitude. <laughs> True story. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You got any gap books, Mike? You've had some time off. 
It's the holiday realm. I have. I don't know how to pronounce the author, but I am finishing up Newsletter Ninja and uh, mentioned at the beginning, I am verbally committing <laughs> to uh, doing a regular newsletter, but I want to do it in a way where I know that I can stick with it and that I'm not doing it just to sell stuff. Uh, I want to figure out basically what are the things that people want to hear from me. So if you have any ideas or anything you'd like to share, you can uh, at Bobblehead Joe on Twitter. I would love to hear that sort of stuff, but I'm kind of just thinking through that stuff now. This is a great book though, in terms of talking through the logistics and like, this is kind of what you should do and the best practices for creating that community-based newsletter, not the the sales-based newsletters. I don't have a better term for that, but. Sure. Makes sense. Well, I'm not doing a technical gap book, but I am leaning pretty heavy into Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities lately. So. All right. Still a good one. I know it's fiction. Since you like stories, Mike. I do. <laughs> I like real stories. <laughs> real stories. All right. Great fun. Great fun. All right. Well, thanks to all of you who have been in the chat. I know we don't always interact with those in the chat because we're actually recording at the time, but it is kind of cool to see some of the comments and sometimes we do bring them up. But we're also extremely grateful to those of you who have been Bookworm members, bookworm.fm slash membership. And uh, it definitely helps, helps keep the lights on, helps us get the hosting fees and stuff, buys a coffee and a book for us once in a while. So Huge thanks to anyone who is uh, a part of that club. And uh, when you join, though, like you do get some perks. It's not just paying for hosting and stuff. Like there are all of Mike's mind node files. He's got his new Rome thing. You sh what is this thing? It's a link <laughs> that apparently I can access without an account. It's a public graph. And I'm basically migrating all of my book notes over from my personal database into the bookworm one. So what you get are pages for all the bookworm episodes and then pages for all of the individual books. Not everything's in there. I was working on it actually before we hit record here today. I think it's through uh, like episodes 83 through 109 are there right now. Sure. Uh, but I also am uh, entertaining the idea of giving edit access to this for bookworm club members if that's something people are interested in. And that would allow us to kind of build off of the notes that I take. You know, that's what a lot of people do with the MindNode files is uh, I've, I've discovered is they download them and they use them as a starting point when they read the books. And I think that's pretty cool. And so what this allows us to do is kind of build like a big bookworm wiki of all of the, <laughs> the books that we've covered for, sure. for bookworm. If you were ever to export that out, could you do anything with it? Yeah, I exported it out of my database and imported it into that one. It's all Markdown Outside based. Outside of Rome. I would think so. I mean, <laughs> haven't tried it. I know that those are just PDF curious. files that are embedded in there. Sure. And the rest of it is just a Markdown Markdown formatted bullets. So, Interesting. Yeah. It just curious and being a snot, that's all. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, for members, there are a handful of perks. And you can get into the bank of perks, bookworm.fm slash membership. That'll take you over to club.bookworm.fm and uh, where you can sign up for that membership and get access to those things. So thank you to all of you who already do that. All right. So thanks everyone for following along. If you are reading along, pick up Discipline Equals Freedom by Jocko Willink. And we will talk to you in a couple of weeks.